when you are exposed to things it gives you options options give you choices and choices require decisions it is critically important that you make this next step into sound decisions every decision that you make has consequences even the smallest decisions consequences are more important than decisions don't ever make a decision more important than a consequence because decisions give birth to consequences people normally say if you make a decision you got to live with it that is not true you live with the consequences are you making yourself better or are you making yourself worse are you moving forward or are you moving back are you making progress or are you stagnating every little decision you make counts some people are afraid to make decisions they just contemplate the options for years and miss the opportunity to change their life because they miss the time factor that is involved in making a great decision so what you must do before you make any decision in life is don't study the decision make sure you exhaust every possible means to study the consequences do your research get information check all the alternatives study the options check those who already made that decision and read their life study their life find out everything before you make a decision deciding to decide to act is a major major challenge for all of us and there are things that happen to us along the way experiences that we have that prevent us from working through the mental block of acting and so what i want you to think about is what is there that you know you need to do but for some reason or another you've been holding back for some reason or another you just have not been able to gather your nerves or be able to work through the procrastinating or putting it off or justifying or blaming some reason or another you just haven't done it Do you know where to hide when discouragement comes flying past your head? Or do you run to the same enemy that is attacking you in an effort to hide? I'm not talking about physical places because the hiding places that we create that destroy us are usually the ones in our heart. Emotional states. When attacks come, I've learned where to run. And the reason that I'm moving forward in my life this year isn't because I won't be attacked, it's because I know what to run to when I am. I don't want to spend the second half of my life repeating the dumb stuff that I did in the first half of my life. Give me the grace, if you will. Give me the mercy, if you please, to make a good decision so that I can eat the fat of the land. I'm not stupid. I just made stupid decisions. I'm not bad. I just made bad decisions. I'm not weak. I just made weak decisions. There are a lot of things you think about you. It's not really you. It's your decisions. When you acknowledge God in all your ways, he will direct your path. But too often, we make our plans without consulting God. Then we ask him to bless those plans. We wonder why it's a struggle, why it feels like it's always uphill. We have it backwards. We're making a move and then asking God for help. The right way is to ask God first. Many people doubt themselves because when they thought about doing something at some critical point in their lives, somebody they respected and honored, somebody they believed in, somebody that they loved, someone they trusted said, you can't do that. 
Most of the people who really ain't got it, they go out of their way to try and show people that they have it. The more you go out of your way to show me that you have it, you're confirming to me that you really don't got it. Because it's perception versus reality. Because you pulling up to the club in the nicest car don't mean you actually got gas money. As you begin to look at your emotional, your spiritual and intellectual development, how many books did you read? How many classes did you take to begin to develop yourself professionally, to improve your craft or your skill? How many new things did you learn? Just take some personal inventory, just thinking, just thinking, just thinking. Beginning to know yourself, what are the things about your past that has influenced you right now? You see, a dream, when you get it, will encourage you. There's something about a dream that brings encouragement and joy to people's lives. It gives you excitement. It encourages you. The people who are discouraged are the people who don't have a dream. Because when you have a dream, it makes you get up in the morning. It makes you put your clothes on and go to work because you've got a dream. And a dream has the power to encourage you. You have not because you ask not. It didn't say you have not because your credit ain't straight. It simply say you have not because you ask not. But you don't ask because you ain't got that together. When you ask God for something, quit tripping. He got it from here. The same wind blows on us all. The wind of disaster, the wind of opportunity, the wind of change, the wind when it's upside down, the wind when it's favorable and unfavorable. The same wind blows on us all, the economic wind, the social wind. The same wind blows on everybody. The difference in where you arrive in one year, three years, five years, the difference in arrival is not the blowing of the wind, but the set of the sail. Some people don't want to be for you, and that's okay. You don't need them to fulfill your destiny. You have to set your face. The people that need to be for you will be for you. God has already lined up the right people, people that will celebrate you people that stick with you through thick and thin. A lot of people never try anything differently because they have been convinced by people in their lives that they value that they can't do it. They're living within the context of the opinions that other people have of them, the low expectations. You need to be patient with the process and not enthralled with the promise. You compromise the rehearsal time and bought the tuxedo for the recital. You want the accruedments of success and that's what's killing you. Now you look like something that you're not. Somebody say wrong focus. Joy can only really come to my life when I am focused on what God is doing in this moment. And I cannot focus on what God is doing in this moment in my life if I'm consumed with what he's doing in somebody else's or if I'm still in regret and bitterness about what happened three years ago or three months ago. A lot of our lack of joy is really not about possession, it's about position. What I mean is this, he set joy before him. It's not a question of God's presence. It's about yours. Are you present in this moment? You can't live off of yesterday's manna and expect to have victory today. Yesterday's information may not work today. Stay open for change. Be willing to try something new. What made you successful five years ago may not make you successful today. Have the attitude, God, I'm ready for new things. If you don't innovate, you will evaporate. You can't rely on what got you to where you are to keep you where you are. The world is changing. You can't afford to sit back on autopilot and just coast, do things the same way. You'll get left behind. But if we're not conscious of dropping a thought or a behavior that's no longer needed, we take old thoughts, old behaviors that serve an old version of ourselves into trying to become the new version of ourselves. So ask yourself that question. What do I need to drop that's no longer needed? Is it a person? Is it a thought? Is it a behavior? Or is it an emotion? If someone is controlling you, it's not their fault 
it's yours. You have to put your foot down, make a change. This is your hour. I know people that spend more time worried about what other people think about them than they do pursuing their own dreams and goals. And it's great to get free from addictions, but one of the greatest freedoms is to get free from people. Being successful, y'all, is not a magic trick. You have to learn the principles of success. You can be successful at anything. You really can, man. I don't have no education. I'm telling you, God has an incredible life for you. All you got to do is ask him for it. Be willing to put in the work. But now this work part is hard. Success is hard. But let me ask you a question. Ain't not being successful hard too? You cannot reach your destiny dragging people along trying to keep everyone happy. Life is like an elevator. The higher you go up, like those spaceships, they let certain stuff off because it's too heavy. Yet some people just too heavy when it comes to drama. You want, when you have goals and dreams and you want to fine tune your life and approach to life, you want to create a drama free zone. What else is in you? Are you ignoring? Is there a version of you you're ignoring? So think about that stuff and really begin to ask yourself, am I satisfied where I am? And start listening to that voice inside of you saying, hey, listen, listen, it's whispering right now, but it's calling you. It's saying there's something more. There's something else. There's something else you can get. Deciding to keep your word. If you just decide, I'm going to keep my word. If I say something, I'm going to do it regardless. Being more considerate more disciplined, being more adventurous. Find something that you can look at your life that you say, hey, I know I've got a problem in this area, being late. I need to take care of that. Procrastinating, I need to deal with that. For things to change, you have to change. I was hoping the government would change and taxes would change. I wished for everything to change. And my teacher said, no, Mr. Owen, for things to change for you, you have to change. Don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. And here's the big one. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. You simply need more skills. Stop telling the old story. Here's the truth. Nobody cares. No one cares if you've had a setback. No one cares if you had a victory. And none of those failures, none of those setbacks, none of those victories, and that old character you keep playing is the very thing that will prevent you from becoming this new version of you not taking care of business, being seriously not serious, creating an imbalance in my life where I'm spending more time looking at television or having social fun and not spending enough time working on me. See, most people, ladies and gentlemen, spend more time working on their jobs than they spend working on themselves. It's a story if you're stuck. It's an old story you're telling with an old character that was last year's version, last decade's version. Who's the new character? What's the new script? What's the new story? Your personal philosophy is like a guidance system that helps you make decisions what to do, what not to do. From the information you get and what you learn and what you know, we decide. Maybe your philosophy would have been uh, five years ago never to attend seminars like this. You just didn't go. Now, five years later, here you are. Something happened along the way. So now, that little amendment in your philosophy, you now say, I'm going to regularly go because it doesn't take but a few ideas to make a great difference in your income, personal life, social life, and all the rest. A change of mind, a change of idea. The more we learn, the more we know, the better we're able to make better decisions. So what is the worst thing that can happen? I want you to visualize that, experience that, feel the nervousness and the discomfort. And the more you run it in your mind, the less power that it will have. Your philosophical guidance system does two things. Number one, helps you to see the dangers on one side, so you can avoid those. But here's what else your guidance system does. Helps you to see the opportunities on the other side, so that you can expand those, maximize those. And here's what that's called. The game of life is to minimize the dangers and maximize the opportunities. And the more we know and the more we learn, the more experience we gather, helps us to keep continually adjusting our philosophical guidance system so that we minimize more dangers, maximize more opportunities. That's really the game of life.
Stop hanging out with people that make you look good by how little they know. And so you can condescend to them so that you can be a great fish in a small pond. Get around people who make you feel stupid because they stretch you. They make you grow. They make you read. They make you study. They stretch you. They expose you to great information. Then you can make great decisions. No matter what's going on in your life, you can be happy and so blessed that people will envy you and envy your life no matter what's going on in your life. Now that blessing is attached to a moral excellence or a virtue of soul called the poor in spirit, which really means the humble-minded, those who are totally dependent on God, and those who don't think that they're better than other people. Have you ever had anybody turn on you? It's, it's one thing to have an enemy. I don't have no problem with that, because if I know you're my enemy, I dress for you. I dress, I come in there prepared, because I already know you and me, we don't do each other. We don't do that, so okay. But the heart cracks when somebody who fought with you now fights against you. The future is actually the place where there is threat and it's always going to be there. So what do you do? You make sacrifices in the present so that the future is better. Everyone does that. That's what you're doing right now. That's what you're doing here. It's amazing. You can bargain with reality. You can forestall gratification now. And it'll pay off at a place and time that doesn't even exist yet. Who would have believed that? It's like that's a miracle that that occurs. Learn number one from your own experiences. Learn number two from other people's experiences. If you want to live a dynamic life, multiplying your income, multiplying your future, be a good student. If a good idea comes your way, write it down, then ponder it, then perhaps go do it. Your philosophy comes from what you learn, comes from what you know, comes from other people's experiences. I want you to focus on what does it take when you look at your life, very important to focus on the examples of other people of what it takes to live the kind of life that you desire. You want to make it in life? Perseverance is important. Persistence is important. And you got to believe in you. And you got to trust God that things are going to work out. You can do goal setting with a pencil, but you have to do goal getting with your legs. And it's the action that separates us. The greatest gap in this world is the gap between knowing and doing. Knowing is goal setting. Doing, now that's goal achieving. You gotta take action. This attitude is rarely found. Well, anyway, if you've been troubled by the old familiar human malady of running up too many roads and trying to run up more than one at a time, pick the one out of all of them which seems to offer the most promise, forget all the rest, and dig a deep, straight highway to your goal in life. You'll be amazed at how quickly it can be reached and the time will pass anyway. A lot of people think that what's possible in their lives is strictly determined by where they came from and what happened to them. No, you have no idea how far you can go, how far you can stretch, how far you can reach. So you've got to take that thing and hold on to that and figure out, well, how can I apply this into my life? If I take this, this might be the day mentality that everything comes together for me. You don't know what's possible in your life. You have no idea how far you can reach, how far you can stretch. You have no idea. The happiest people on earth are those who are emotionally involved in what they're doing. This calm, cool, collected bit is all right for cows, camels, and turtles, but it'll never produce a great sermon, symphony, business, piece of architecture, painting, marriage, or the miracle of a child. But when you lose the excitement and heightened feeling of emotion in what you're doing, you'd best look around for something else. Humans have an unreal capacity to get great at things, even if they don't have a natural talent for it, if they're immersed in it, and to learn something and acquire a ton of knowledge in a short period of time as well. Society is conspiring all the time in our culture to completely distract you so you never win. And they get these different things on television and our phones and in our lives to just get us distracted so we never get obsessed, we never get laser focused for an extended period of time. People without vision, perish and they die in a life of mediocrity. They die with their dreams still in them. They die living a mis-
place life, making the cemetery rich in Miles Monroe angry. So for me, my brain saying that's it right there. Move as fast as a rocket, Mel. I wanted to change my life. And I think most people that are miserable or that are that are really like dying to be great, we want to change. We want to live a better life. We want to create more for our families. We want to be happier. The, the desire is there. It's about how do you go from knowledge to action. If you do something often enough, a ratio will appear. Key phrase, if you do something often enough, a ratio will appear. It's amazing. In baseball, we call it batting average. If you talk to 10 people, one says yes. Now the ratio has begun. One out of 10. Here's something interesting about the law of averages. Once it starts, it tends to continue. I talk a lot about your instincts and inner wisdom. When you set goals, when you have an intention on something that you want to change about your life, your brain helps you. What it does is it opens up a checklist and then your brain goes to work trying to remind you of that intention that you set. And it's really important to develop the skill of knowing how to hear that inner wisdom and that intention kicking in and leaning into it quickly. If you're in a negative vibration, the only thing you can attract to you is something negative. How do you change? Well, one good way is consciously pick the people you associate with. Pick with people who are winning. Go mix with them. Do what they do. They always say give and give from your heart. But I want to add to that and say that sometimes when you give from your heart, you are empowering people. And when you empower the wrong one who has malicious intent, they got their hand out because they have no power. They're weak, they're broke, they're struggling. Something is going on and you reach your hand out to them. You let them move into your home. You let them borrow money. You let them use your car. You let them have access to you and everything that comes with you. So therefore, you are empowering them. You put your hand out to them and you help them to get off the ground. With that hand, they take your hand and as soon as they get off the ground, that hand becomes a fist and they proceed to knock you out. and gave to people who sued me, who lied on me, who betrayed me, who broke my heart and let me down. I have been betrayed so many times that when you don't betray me, I'm shocked. I'm scared to believe that you might be real. We've all been used, we've all been taken advantage of. It doesn't feel good. And when you get used and taken advantage of or manipulated, it makes you stop, think, and start looking at everybody the same way. It makes you question any and everything and everybody because you were used, manipulated, and taken advantage of. You're doing everything and operating and coming from your heart. But unfortunately, other people have malicious, evil, and vindictive intentions towards you. And all you have to do is forgive those, but more importantly, learn from it experience is your highest truth and I don't want you to ignore the truth I don't want you to disown the experience there was an open hand from your heart to help somebody get on their feet and once you took their hand they took that same hand that you helped them get up with turned it into a fist and tried to figure out a way to knock you out If you've got somebody that's dragging, that's going down the downward spiral, and you decide that you're just going to pour everything into them, well, then you're going to go down that downward spiral as well. And now you're not going to be able to help them. So I think you definitely have to take care of yourself as a person so that you have the platform to take care of someone else and help someone move in the right direction. Oftentimes, when you think you're helping someone, you're really just enabling them. 
you got to detach. You got to make sure you're not becoming emotional. You got to make sure that you're seeing the person and the situation for what it really is. Not what you want it to be, but what it really is, who they really are, what they are really doing. And then when you're detached, you got to make logical decisions from that point of detachment to decide whether this person can be helped and how far you're willing to go to help them. And you got to remember, you can't be a hero to everybody. Sometimes it takes you a minute to process what to do when, when right goes wrong. You're not ready for a new relationship because you can't figure out what happened in the old relationship because you, you say, I gave my very best and it went wrong. And so I have lost confidence in my best. Because you left me with the notion that maybe my best isn't good enough. So I'm not sure that anybody will ever see my best again. Because I did it from my heart. I did it from my heart. And now I know what young people do not know. Is that right can go wrong. People who are not your children, you are under no obligation to help people. You're not responsible for another adult's happiness, well-being, or welfare. You're not responsible for that. Nor should you make yourself responsible for another person. Take that pressure off you. First of all, if they didn't have your number, what would they do? I always say that. You're her friend. She's not your friend. You have a one-sided friendship. So what you got to do is you got to even it out just when the phone rang, you know not to answer because she wants something. So don't answer. Here's the best thing to do. Stop using your voicemail on your phone because I'm going to teach you something. And do you notice that 95% of all your voicemails are a request? Let your voicemail fill up and don't ever empty. Don't you become the 911 in everybody's life. Just stop. Release yourself from the pressure. Now, her number, I would just block her number. I just learned how to block numbers this past Christmas. Oh, my God. Did you all know that? It's the greatest. Oh, my God. Oh, oh. That's what I gave myself for Christmas. My life's so good right now. Some of y'all right now are in relationships and friendships that you are clearly being used and taken advantage of. They're either going to come after your man when you let them live with you, come after your wife. They're jealous of who you are and all the things you have, and yet they're using you for these various things. Pay attention to people and who they really are. Don't manipulate your mind to thinking, you know what, maybe I'm just being a negative person. There's this thing called instincts, intuition, and discernment. Pay attention to them. Don't disown them because you will end up in pain in the end. If you don't move on the discernment, the instincts, and the intuition about people, things, and situations. Despite the fact that these are some of the clearest, most easily recognized elements of strong character, in the real world, they're also some of the most difficult to find. It seems it's always been that way. In ancient Greece, the philosopher Demosthenes went searching for an honest man, and he never found one. I've been fortunate. I think I've known a great many honest people. But if I measured that number up against all the less than ethical people I've encountered, I guess I'd have to admit that even in my experience, honesty and integrity are rather rare. Why is that? I hope to provide some answers. I want to start talking about honesty by looking at the exact opposite of honest behavior. There was a time when telling a lie was very serious business. I'm speaking now of the days before lawsuits and legally enforceable contracts. In those days, lying was a very serious matter. It was also very serious if you accused someone of lying. Today, a breach of integrity in a business matter might mean calling in the lawyers, 
But for hundreds of years in the past, calling someone a liar was the most common way to provoke a duel, at first with swords, later with pistols. Dishonesty was treated like a personal insult that demanded immediate redress. You have to think, you can't just feel, you have to think. You know, even when you're taking care of kids, part of what you're doing is being compassionate. But if you're too compassionate towards your kids, then you do everything for them. And if you do everything for them, then they grow up useless and they never leave and they hate you. And they hate everything else too. It's a bad idea. You know, there's a rule if you're working in a place like a nursing home. And the rule is, it's a harsh rule. Do not do anything for the people that you're taking care of that they can do for themselves. And so if they have to struggle to feed themselves, you don't bloody well intervene and feed them. You let them maintain their damn independence. And you have to be a hard-hearted bastard to do that, you know, to watch someone struggle like that. But you're furthering their medium to long-term independence and development, and you do the same thing with your children. Treating your children like they're endless permanent victims is a very bad idea. And one of the problems with being really strong is that no one ever asks you if you're okay. No one ever comes to you in the same way that you generally reach out to other people. And I know because I've experienced this. I tend to be the rock that most people lean on. And where is it and how is it that you can find someone that can pull you up? It has been a challenge of mine and it's something that really used to bother me to a, at a real visceral level for so many years. I'm to the point where I wanted to cry because it's like, who can I lean on? And I know that's your problem. I know that's what you're dealing with and you're asking me, how do I go find a mentor? How do I find someone that could support me? What I found is that there are two types of mentors that have been most valuable in my journey to becoming a stronger version of myself. That through books. You're going to find that there are certain individuals who have written volumes and volumes of texts that will support you in almost every area and endeavor in your life. But you also need someone who's there with you, who's talking to you, who you can touch and see, who's going to support you. And it's not easy to find that type of person. In fact, those that are, that, that are more able to help you than others in that regard are really busy. Their time is spoken for on so many different levels. When I say I have mentors and I go see mentors, it's not that I was so lucky that some older man took me under his wing. But to get the undivided attention of someone who you know has that magnetic strength that we mentioned earlier, that you have. You're going to have to trade a portion of your energy with that person so that they can give you that because their time is valuable. Because you've been through some stuff and you can help them, give them advice, give them insight over things that they may be struggling with. This is what the love circle is. We spread love. I got 18 million followers because I've been spreading love. That's what this is about, nothing else. I don't care about the numbers if I'm not trying to impact and change lives. When people write comments and tell their stories, respond to 10 people without you knowing you have signed up to be a part of the love circle. I love you. Tag whoever needs to see this video and make sure you share it. Everyone knew the big problems that could result if you got caught, so lying to another person took a certain amount of, what's the right word, foolish bravery maybe. But there's no such risk today, is there? Some people lie all the time without thinking about it. Most people know when they're being lied to, which they may find irritating, but they just accept it. Maybe they decide to become liars themselves. In any case, very few duels are being fought. To explain this, I think we can make a comparison between how some people today feel about lying and how they feel about money. It used to be you either had money or you didn't. When you bought something and the bill came, you had to pay it or there was an immediate problem there were only two alternatives. You took care of your debts or you were a thief. Some people would literally take their own lives if they couldn't honor their debts. I'm sure we agree that's not exactly true any longer. Many people don't feel the same kind of personal responsibility about paying debts promptly. And today, of course, we can put off paying for our purchases as long as we can make the minimum payment on our credit card. 
That pain that comes with having to shell out hard cash for something, the pain of maybe having to give something up in order to have this thing, we can avoid that pain. We can put it off indefinitely as plastic debt. Of course, there's going to be a high rate of interest on that debt, and the balance due can quickly mount up, but most people don't even think about that. It's a price they're willing to pay in order to have exactly what they want right now. There are many situations where it's painful to tell the truth. It's painful in just the same way that paying a big fat bill is painful. In fact, we even use the same words to talk about paying debts and telling the truth. We may talk about somebody's word being like money in the bank. We talk about being held accountable, about having to account for yourself, about being called to account. If you've done something that you're really not proud of and you're called to account for it, well, what does that feel like? How do you handle it? What are your options when you've got to explain something that makes you uncomfortable? Well, it's a bit like that moment of decision when the credit card bill comes every month. If you want to pay off the whole balance, there may be some pain and sacrifice involved. You may have to grit your teeth. You know that your life will be simpler in the long run, but it's going to hurt a little right now to pay off the new golf clubs or the new computer. Or how about the 60-foot yacht? I don't actually know if you can put a yacht on a credit card, but I've certainly known people who would if they could. Gritting your teeth and paying in full can hurt. So quite often it seems easier to pay the minimum and delay the pain until next month. It's easier to float the truth of your finances off into a little imaginary plastic flying carpet and sail it into the mailbox. Of course, it's not really a flying carpet. It's more like a boomerang that's going to come around and hit you in the back of the head someday. But as Scarlett O'Hara once said, I guess I'll think about that tomorrow. For the time being, it's gone with the wind. Let me give you some good advice about avoiding a bankrupt character. Pay your ethical debts. Keep your integrity in the black. Face ugly realities with the truth as soon as they appear. When you feel that temptation to hedge, resist it immediately. Don't treat it casually. Treat it like a grease fire in the kitchen that you've got to put out before it burns your house down or fills the whole place up with so much smoke that you can't see where you're going anymore. Because that's exactly what will happen when your ethical capital runs out. You just won't be able to see where you're going anymore. Here's another way that being untruthful is like buying on credit. They're both addictive. At first, they both go down so easy and they leave you wanting more. Any addictive behavior offers a simple short-term escape from a problem. But that escape becomes more and more complicated as time goes on. Lying can get extremely complicated. You've really got to have an outstanding memory to be a good liar because you're always having to create more lies that are consistent with the one you told in the first place. I'm sure we have at some time been caught up in a dilemma like that. Shakespeare had it right all along. What a tangled web we weave when at first we practice to deceive. Maybe you think I'm being a bit tough here. Am I really saying that in every instance you've got to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So if somebody asks me, how are you today? I'm supposed to say, well, I gotta be honest with you, I have a sore finger, last night I had a headache, and I've got to admit that my foot hurts a little. No, that's not what I mean. In fact, I think there are many times when some flexibility with the whole truth and nothing but the truth is called for, and I'll be discussing those later. Outright lying, however, planned lying, lying with an ulterior motive, lying for personal gain, that kind of lying is definitely something to be avoided. But untruthfulness is so tempting today, and I want to spend a little more time on it. I want to make a clear distinction between what I call foolish lying, or silly lying, or stupid lying, and lying that is downright evil and poisonous to the character. Boasting, bombast, blarney, bragging, these are all the same thing. They're always floating around in the atmosphere, and they can affect you at any time, like catching a cold. They're mostly harmless. 
unless you start building a whole personality around them, which has definitely happened to some people. I should mention that there's such a thing as boasting in reverse too. People who flaunt their frugality, people who poor mouth, people who are oppressively ostentatious in their lack of ostentation. This is actually becoming a bit more common. Keep an eye out for it. All of this is childish trash talk, and it's usually spontaneous. It comes from succumbing to a moment of social pressure. It's not the kind of behavior that defines strong character, but even strong characters have been known to indulge in it. Ernest Hemingway was a great writer and one of the most powerful personalities of the century, but he could be reckless too. In any case, this kind of bragging and blarney should be distinguished from what I consider real lying. Real lying isn't like putting bills on the credit card. Real lying is like theft. In my opinion, a key element in this kind of real lying is the presence of planning and premeditation. If somebody is a supervisor in a corporation and he steals one of his subordinates' ideas and takes credit for it in the eyes of the CEO, that requires a whole chain of events and a conscious decision to keep the deception going through the various links in the chain. That kind of lying is theft. It's not only theft of the subordinate's idea, it's stealing from the CEO too. It's stealing the CEO's sense of reality. It's creating an illusion. If someone falsifies an earnings report in order to inflate the price of a company's stock, that's deliberately creating a mirage in the minds of the investors. In the real world, both these examples have happened, and many times, lives and careers have been ruined. It's been my experience that those who engage in serious lying and unethical behavior get caught one way or the other. Usually the people who are being deceived awaken from the illusions that have been foisted upon them. But even if this never happens, the criminal, and I don't think that's too strong a word, has to buy into the illusion so deeply himself that his own sense of reality is eroded. By trying to loosen other people's grasp of the truth, you end up losing your own. All of it, small time lying and big time deceit. It all comes from fear. Somebody is afraid the truth about themselves isn't good enough, so they depart from the truth. Somebody secretly fears that they can't really come up with ideas of their own, so they steal somebody else's ideas. Or they fear their company isn't really going to succeed, so they come up with a way to inflate the share prices. It's really cowardice. Courage is fearing the right thing at the right time and in the right way. Fear the temptation to misrepresent who you are or what you've done or intend to do. Trust who you really are. Trust your ability to earn the respect of others. Pay whatever price the truth costs. Pay that bill immediately, because in the long run, it's a real bargain.